Hi, this is Paul McGuire, and you are listening to a prophetic emergency alert. On today's program, I want to talk about the nature of reality. What is real? Now, why that's an important question is because you and I, as we've heard this expression used numerous times in the last decade or so, we live in something like a virtual matrix. And what that simply means is that we live in an artificial reality. The reality that we see with our senses, our sight, our ears, our smell, our taste buds, etc., the tactile senses of our fingers or whatever, that's what you call sensory reality. Now, for over a hundred years, the scientific community decided that the only physical reality that was real, because it could be scientifically measured through your senses, like seeing and hearing and tasting, the only scientific reality that was real was what we call physical reality. So that idea, concept by scientists um, of a physical reality being the only true or real or final reality became known as uh, secular humanism and what is called scientific materialism. Now by scientific materialism that's, that's just a fancy word for saying um, the material in front of you like boxes or bicycles or cars or whatever, that's real and something else isn't it because you can perceive it with your senses. But there was a big problem in the scientific community and there still is today. And, and the problem existed because the premier scientists, the scientists of the globalist elite if you will, the scientific elite, people like Sir Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, which just gripped my mind and consciousness when I read it in third grade. Um, he believed, as many of the elite classes do, and, and most people in America, etc., are not even aware of the fact that there, there exists a technocratic elite, or a scientific elite, or a globalist elite. But, but there is. But you see, they play a game publicly. They, they pretend to be staunch uh, atheists, secular humanists, scientists. And so they publicly uh, put on this act that the only thing that's real or true is what we can perceive with our physical senses. Because, why? Because what we see with our physical senses provides scientific evidence that this reality is here. So if you start to talk to them about a greater spiritual reality, and by spiritual reality I'm not talking about Eastern mystical reality. I'm not talking about yoga, uh, the Kundalini serpent power, uh, altered states of consciousness reality because that reality is questionable. It's questionable because it's all contingent upon somebody's private or personal experience or opinion. So in, in that worldview, the Eastern mystical worldview, the uh, occult view, worldview, uh, in that worldview, experience is, is God, experience is the king, experience is the final say-so. What you experience or what I experience triumphs over everything else. Well, the problem with that, as you know, is that 
experiences are subjective. My experience may be completely different than your experience. And yet, I may be convinced that my experience is true and reality. And conversely, you may be, or millions of people that you know may be, uh, convinced that their internal experience is the real thing. So, so how do you decide what is what Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who, uh, the great evangelical theologian who's been dead now for about 75 years, but he was the greatest evangelical theologian in the last 150 years, and he, he developed the term final reality, and true truth to describe what was really real uh, beyond our physical imagination, the imagination in our brain, and what was really true, or true truth, what was really true beyond our differing private opinions based on our different experiences. And he warned the Christian culture of a great danger from a theological perspective or a biblical perspective as well as a scientific uh, perspective. And that's why he, he coined the terms true truth and final reality. In other words, um, there are people on planet Earth who believe in all kinds of things all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of ideas, like let's say uh, this one, uh, people who believe the earth is flat. Um, I, I really don't want to disparage people, but let me just be gentle and quick about it. The earth is not flat, okay? Uh, and I don't have time to do a whole program on it. But you set yourself up for enormous ridicule and not only that, you set yourself up as, as a, an ambassador uh, of Christ because you, you claim to be a Christian, but you're also claiming that the world is flat. And thinking, intelligent, scientific, and rational people are going to have a big problem with that, and they should. And so what you have done, perhaps not meaning to, is you have ended up discrediting uh, the authority uh, of God's Word. Now, not that there's anything that you can do individually in the long term to discredit the authority of God's Word. Why? Because God doesn't need your permission, the atheist permission, the secular humanist uh, permission, or my permission. God does not need anybody's permission <laughs> to be the infinite personal living God of the universe, which he is. In true truth, or final reality, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the truth beyond anyone's personal opinion. It's true truth or it's final reality. Now, you have a right to... to uh, if somebody says, like I just said to you, Jesus Christ is um, the infinite personal living God of the universe, or if I say to you, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, which is true, objectively, whether or not you believe in it, I believe in it, or, you know, any famous atheist, you know, Jesus Christ doesn't need the permission of a famous atheist author to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> the inquiry is ridiculous. Why? Because it's self-evident. And you say to me, well, how can you be so uh, uh, brazen to say that Jesus Christ being a King of Kings and Lord of Lords is self-evident? Well, I can say that with, with total confidence that it's true because, in my opinion, but it's not based on my opinion, from my understanding and research uh, that has lasted over 40 years, 
and my research has included the writing of uh, 35 books where I have uh, studied and taught uh, on this kind of, of subject matter. And after 40 years of research, as well as personal experience, trial and error, call it personal scientific experiments, I have come to the conclusion, as, as hundreds of millions of other people throughout history have, many of them brilliant intellects, intellectuals, scientists, philosophers, you know, people like C.S. Lewis, the brilliant author and apologist for Christianity. In Romans, now I believe that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant Word of God, that it was supernaturally authored by God through the Holy Spirit. God wrote the book through men writing under the direct anointing and inspiration and guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is my primary source of authority. Upon, it is the foundation upon which I can proclaim Jesus is Lord or Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords or God is the infinite personal living God of the universe. Why? Because the Bible is completely different and unique than any other book ever written. The Bible is the only book ever written that has stood the test of time for thousands of years. The Bible is the only book ever written that has in it thousands of prophecies that predict in great accuracy what's going to happen in the future. And many, if not most, of those prophecies have come true precisely and accurately as God predicted supernaturally in, in the Word of God. No other book can claim that authentication. We could talk about famous religions, famous gurus, famous spiritual teachers, but none of the books that they have written or appealed to, even remotely, even remotely come close to the accuracy, the scientific empir empirical inquiry, the analysis that the Bible uh, has withstood for thousands of years. In addition to that, the Bible is the only book that claims to be the inspired and errant Word of God. And 
the Bible is accurate in terms of history, science, economics, spirituality, every area in life that the Bible deals with, the Bible is 100% accurate in that area, in that, in, in that analysis. So, for example, theologically or spiritually, the Bible gives us an account that is so airtight. It's the account of the birth, the death, and the resurrection, and, and the promise of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And um, the, the entire New Testament is, is laid out as if you were supplying testimony for a legal courtroom. The, the number of witnesses is overwhelming. The, the, the amount of evidence gathered or accumulated is overwhelming. The countless Bible prophecies that predicted what was going to happen with Jesus, including his virgin birth, including the fact that the Roman soldiers uh, stole his, his uh, clothing or garments, uh, the predictions of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ in Isaiah, the predictions of uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because he came to be the Lamb of God, a sacrifice, sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world is another proof. The, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the healings, the deliverances, all predicted in accuracy in the Old Testament by numerous Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and others thousands of years before it happened. And then finally, the crucifixion is predicted in the Bible. And not only the crucifixion or the death of Jesus Christ, but his burial is predicted. And they just didn't hide Jesus' body somewhere, because as you know, the Pharisees, the, these religious leaders, they were on hyper alert because they were terrified that the followers of Jesus Christ would conspire and, and hide the body of Jesus, steal it when nobody was looking, hide the body of Jesus, and then lie to everybody and tell everybody that Jesus resurrected from the dead. So the Pharisees demanded of the Roman soldiers, there were many of them that surrounded the tomb. The tomb had only one way in and out. There were no windows by which they could have snuck Jesus out. And, and the caliber of Roman soldiers that uh, surrounded uh, the tomb, they were the equivalent of uh, Navy Special Ops or U.S. Marines or other high echelon military that are trained way, way above and beyond the average soldier. And they stood guard all around the tomb all night long and there was a giant stone, a giant stone, that not, no one man could have moved, blocking the doorway and the entrance and exit into the tomb. And when they moved that giant stone from the tomb, and this is all recorded in legal detail, in legal precision in the entire New Testament. And when they looked in, they saw an empty tomb. They looked, and the body of Jesus Christ was missing. Jesus was, was not in the tomb where he was buried dead. They did medical tests on him, on his body, uh, when he died. They wanted medical proof, medical evidence that he indeed did die. So when they ran that spear into the side of Jesus Christ's body, and it it, it spewed out both like a liquid water substance and it spewed out blood. That spewing out of those two different substances 
happens to be a medical proof of death or imminent death. And they had other medical proofs that he died. So they placed him dead in, in the tomb with the giant rock in front of the door. Then they moved the giant rock in front of the door. They look into the tomb. Jesus Christ's body is not there. It's missing. The only thing that's in that tomb is something very odd. Two supernatural angels of God are sitting there. And they're talking to the Roman soldiers, the Pharisees, and the crowds. Then later on, this Jesus Christ, who was supposedly crucified, dead and buried, is mysteriously appearing to the disciples and uh, to other people. And this same Jesus Christ, who is supposed to be dead, who was dead, uh, is seen appearing in different places. And he's doing very strange things that no human being can do in front of multiple witnesses, as if he was giving testimony in a courtroom trial regarding the authenticity and reliability of the Word of God. And so Jesus is seen literally in a, a new kind of body. They're not sure what kind of body it is. But Jesus Christ is seen walking through walls. Now, either they were dropping, either they were doing microdoses of LSD or ketamine or mescaline like the high-tech, big-tech people do in uh, Silicon Valley, you know, the big craze is to microdose psychedelics. So either the crowd was microdosing psychedelics, or Jesus really was walking through walls. Now that was very pro problematic to the religious leaders, because the average person <laughs> can't walk through walls. Okay, we're going to dive into this deeper, and we're going to expose or uncover the secret no, not the secret that Oprah Winfrey and others uh, are popularizing with their books and films. We're going to reveal and expose a far, far more powerful secret. A secret not only to the meaning of life, but a secret that is unprecedented in its revolutionary, spiritual revolutionary impact uh, to our world and to our individual lives. We'll be back in a moment or we'll be back at the next uh, prophetic emergency alert because everything I'm talking about has a direct impact on where America is going in the future and where the world is going in the future and what is going to happen to your life in the future. So visit paulmcguire.us, that's paulmcguire.us, help spread this message far and wide. We have our Roku channel with hundreds of Bible prophecy and Bible teachings and ministry I've given at Paradise Mountain Church International. You can renew your mind and be fed spiritually by going to paulmcguire.us and then going to the Roku channel and watching hundreds of hours free, no charge obviously, um, where I'm ministering and teaching and uh, preaching at Paradise Mountain Church and at conferences and interviews, etc. It's all there. Then you can take advantage of the free ar archives. That means all the radio programs of the Paul McGuire Report, the free archives, of the prophetic emergency alert and then we have all the books for you like right now you can pre-order um, my brand new book you can pre-order right now at a financial discount power from on high I consider power from on high one of the most important books I've ever written in my life specifically because it contains answers for the time period we're in. And then we have the other books available at a financial discount if you go to paulmcguire.us. 
like the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2, and Conquering the Matrix. Now, I've written 35 books. They all build upon one another. There's, a, there's numerous themes that are interwoven in all the books that I've written as they build on one another. It was, it, it was like, I don't claim, by the way, my, my books are not the inspired, inerrant Word of God. I don't have a Messiah complex. But I believe God has supernaturally led me uh, and guided me through His Word by developing a biblical worldview internally, which means I have spent a lifetime uh, influenced by Dr. Francis Schaeffer, I've spent a lifetime studying, absorbing um, information, data, and content from diverse fields such as philosophy, history, um, science, biology, physics, government, law, uh, the study of ancient super civilizations, Bible prophecy, biblical theology, psychology, cybernetics, uh, culture, art, film, entertainment, um, uh, an in-depth study of the uh, American Revolution to the French Revolution to the Marxist Communist Revolution to the uh, global uh, uh, reset revolution. And I have integrated my study in many of these diverse fields and others, including technology. I've integrated studying all these diverse fields by developing a biblical worldview and applying the truth of God's Word and the truth of Scripture, where it speaks about spiritual things, but where it also speaks about things like economics and society. And I've integrated a biblical worldview and, and a knowledge of, of the Word of God, okay? That has empowered me and energized me and guided me to do a deep dive and analysis into many areas that um, are having a critical impact on our nation, our world, our society, our global culture, etc., etc. And so, I believe God, you know, I don't claim to be a prophet. I do have prophetic gifts. Um, I'm a professor of uh, eschatology or Bible prophecy. The Lord uses me prophetically, but I don't call myself a prophet because I believe in the biblical definition of the word prophet. And, and to call yourself a prophet in the sense of like the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Daniel, uh, the prophet Ezekiel, etc., you have to be 100%, 100% accurate in all your prophecies and predictions. If you miss it just once, According to Old Testament law, if a prophet misses it just once, that prophet, according to Old Testament law, is, is called a false prophet. And according to Old Testament law, I'm not advocating that, by the way. I'm not advocating that. But according to Old Testament law, that false prophet is supposed to be stoned to death. Now again, like I said, being the third time. I'm not advocating that, but you see, we have a problem uh, in the body of Christ in America and the world right now. Because we have many voices rising, both male and female, where people claim to be prophets. And, and they are saying that God spoke to them directly, either in a vision or a dream or words or whatever. And then they proclaim prophetic things. So, for example, there were dozens and dozens of prophets, so-called prophets, alleged prophets. There were dozens and dozens of prophets who 
said to the body of Christ, especially via media, that they prophetically knew the outcome of the last election, and quote, God told them that Donald Trump, 100% guaranteed, was going to win the election. The problem with that is very serious and significant. The problem is Donald Trump did not win the election. He did not become guaranteed the next president of the United States. In fact, he lost the election. So, we have countless prophets who have guaranteed the body of Christ that Trump would win the election, and it, it wasn't even really a contest. Now, the fact that they proclaimed, predicted, and prophesied a complete and utter falsehood, which is a deception, by the way, you have to ask the question regarding their false prophecies. The vast majority, by the way, and I'm not trying to be unkind, I'm simply trying to be truthful. The vast majority, by the way, who have never stood up and held themselves accountable for their false prophecy, the majority of them who uh, never admitted or repented of their false prophecy regarding Trump, they're just, they went on their merry way. But you see, that's an indicator of a deeper problem. If you have a sizable percentage of the supernatural body of Christ, that's all true Christians, who are getting their guidance, their divine guidance, if you will. They're getting their guidance, their wisdom, their knowledge, their directions. They're making decisions based on information from these prophets who have proven themselves to be false prophets. That's a, that's a disaster in the making. Because, because what you have is essentially leaders in modern Christianity leading the people of God astray because the data, the content they're giving them is false. It fits into, it fits into and I don't enjoy saying this by the way, but it fits into the biblical category of false prophets and false prophecy. So, I want to I want to expose something when we come back with the next prophetic emergency alert. I don't take enjoyment. The Bible says, "Speak the truth in love." Um, I don't enjoy discussing this at all. I have a, a reluctance, not because I'm afraid. I'm not afraid even remotely of talking about it. What I am afraid of is. Um, the Lord's displeasure of me if I don't speak the truth in accuracy and if I don't speak the truth in love. I, I'm not afraid of doing that, but in a healthy sense, not in a psychopathic sense, but in a healthy sense, I fear the Lord. I fear the Lord's displeasure if I was to move into the area of arrogance or whatever. Because I am a man just like any other man, and you're a woman just like any other woman, and so on and so forth. We are all fallen creatures. Every single one of us are fallen creatures and are born with a sinful human nature. Therefore, we all have an inner propensity to sin. And I don't want to embarrass, not that I could embarrass him because he's king of kings and lord of lords, but I don't want to risk offending my lord and savior Jesus Christ out of my love for him and I know that he loves me, but I don't want to offend him and, and add confusion to an already toxic mess. Anyway, you're listening to the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. Spread this message far and wide. And visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us.